Perhaps playing a role helps you sleep at night. Pretending, 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 pretending. This is communication tactics. Playing a role. How dare you? Blah, 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 blah. Ignoring the crucial aspect of equity. Playing a role. Pretending. The show is over. We've heard from leaders about their goals and their aims. I'd like to now come to an activist who has sparked a worldwide change in consciousness. Activist is quite the go-to word nowadays to excuse people's behavior. In the media, linguistic choices are made all the time. These choices affect our understanding of a given issue, a perception of a given person, whether we perceive a person as good or bad. If a person's called an activist enough times, people start assuming that he or she is one of the good guys, and a positive discourse is created about said person. In order to maintain the positive discourse, the host doesn't mention the resistance that Greta also faces, because we can't have anything negative spoil the mood. She was with he us here live at the Austrian World Summit two years ago. She had a very stark message for us then saying, we've done enough traveling, we've done enough talking, it is time to act. Greta Thunberg, thank you so much for being with us once again. What's your message for us this year? An adjective like stark, presupposing that Greta's message was indeed stark and... What's your message for us this year? emphasize that we as the audience are the passive, lucky recipients of whatever message she has for us. But that's the problem. People like Greta almost never engage in debates with anyone who opposes them. Monologues are their preferred or only form of communication. Monologues save them from having to ground their claims. Instead, they can use pathos and fear strategies as they please. And Greta wastes no time. She goes into speech mode immediately. Thank you for having me. Tomorrow, 150 weeks will have passed since the, we started the school strike for the climate. And during this time, more and more people around the world have woken up to the climate and ecological crisis, putting more and more pressure on you, the people in power. Eventually, the public pressure was too much, and you had the world's eyes on you. So you started to act. Not acting as in taking climate action but acting as in role-playing. <laughs> playing politics, playing with words and playing with our future. Pretending to take responsibility, acting as saviors as you try to convince us that things are being taken care of. Meanwhile, the gap between your rhetorics and reality keeps growing wider and wider. This is communication tactics dressed as politics, disguised as politics. That's some intro. Welcoming Greta to this summit comes at a cost. A key component of almost any positive discourse about a person or cause is oversimplification. Greta has an interest in creating an us and them discourse, even though, given the resistance she also faces, this we isn't as unanimous as she presupposes that it is. More and more people, you had the world's eyes on you. In a debate, you have to prove your claims. In a speech, not so much. The most central presupposition is the noun crisis. Thus, in order for the audience to feel like a part of Greta's collective we, they must first agree that there is a crisis. Unlike debates, where the opponent often challenges the speaker's presuppositions, speeches allow politicians and self-professed activists to use presuppositions, as if they're simply referring to common knowledge. That's how terms like crisis become the hegemony, the winning discourse, when discussing a topic like this. Greta even presupposes it as reality. The gap between your rhetorics and reality. Therefore, it's a little ironic to hear Greta criticizing or pretending to criticize the people in power. The people in power. When her side already has the power, rhetorically speaking, but also politically speaking, considering the consequences that their ideas already have for consumers. You can always have these big corporations that put pressures on the consumers to make changes in their lives, spend a little bit more money on um, having like sustainable makeup wipes. You can always... Yes, you can always do that. I mean, it's not like the prices on, say, gas and groceries are already high enough. If only people would just spend a little bit more money, so the politicians can keep spending their money for them. Since the, we started the school strike for the climate. How strange, I never would have thought that strike was school students' preferred way of showing their concern. 
we are still seeing that today, people trying out different methods. Mm. And eventually I find something that worked for me, which was school strike. We're thinking about the rest of the world in the future, so it really feels like it's for the bigger picture. She carries this sign, which is School Strike for Climate in Swedish. Hey. Guess who's employee of the month again? Thank you, sir. Of course, you're the only employee, but the best nonetheless. Now, obviously, keeping that title isn't easy. We all have to make sacrifices in the crisis we're in. Which sacrifices, sir? Well, I think it's only fair that we take a small percentage of your salary to invest in a green future. Only 30 to 35 percent, I promise. 30 to 35 percent? You do want to keep your title, don't you? Yes, of course, sir. I just... Good. It's settled then. Let's have a good day today. Greta uses terms and phrases to describe bad behavior that the opposing side would accuse her of engaging in. So could her statements actually be projection? Role-playing. Playing with words, rhetorics, communication tactics. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school. Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? Role-playing. Communication tactics. There is no planet B. There is no planet blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Build back better. Blah, blah, blah. Green economy. Blah, blah, blah. Playing with words. Acting as saviors. Did you hear me? What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. Acting as saviors. And since the level of awareness is so low, you almost get away with it. So the awareness is low, but apparently it's still high enough to put pressure on the people in power. Putting more and more pressure on you, the people in power. So you started to act. Still high enough to keep the only officially allowed narrative in Western societies going. I wonder why Greta and all the people behind Greta would have an interest in portraying the awareness as low. It wouldn't happen to be because they have a book they want to sell, would it? I have spent the last one year and a half putting together a book in an attempt to communicate a holistic picture. These crises are the biggest story in the world. It must be told in books and articles, in movies and songs, at breakfast tables, lunch meetings and family gatherings, in lifts, at bus stops and in rural shops in schools, boardrooms and marketplaces, in the fields, in the warehouses and on the factory floors, at union meetings, political workshops and football games, in kindergartens and in old people's homes, in hospitals and at music festivals, on social media and the evening news, on dusty country roads and in the streets and alleys of our towns and cities, everywhere, all the time. Everywhere, all the time, indeed. I don't think she forgot to mention a single place, Unless you can't share it on clean country roads. On dusty country roads. That's how all objective and reliable narratives that welcome critical thinking are forced upon. I mean, promoted to people. Pretending to wage war against fossil fuels while opening up brand new coal mines, oil fields and pipelines. This is called a synecdoche, a part of the problem that's used to represent the whole. Here it's coal mines, oil fields and pipelines. Words that are part of the script that she has a habit of repeating. The people in power cannot claim that they are trying, because they are clearly not, as they continue opening up brand new coal mines, oil fields and pipelines. However, it doesn't necessarily follow, as she tries to make it seem, that just because there are coal mines, oil fields and pipelines, the people in power aren't trying. People's lives depend on these things, but monologues conveniently save the speaker from having to come up with detailed solutions on how to quite literally change the way the world works, from each and every country's economy to each individual family's way of life. Thus, synecdoches are part of the oversimplification tactic. Pretending to have the most ambitious climate policies while granting new oil licenses, exploring future oil fields. The oversimplification doesn't stop there. Bragging about your so-called ambitious climate commitments, which, if you look holistically, are vastly insufficient, and then get caught not even trying to reach those targets. 
And of course, Greta looks at things holistically, although it's strange that her rhetoric resembles the rhetoric of the people in power who act as saviors. I wonder why she's so good at recognizing savior rhetoric when she doesn't use that, because unlike the people in power, she isn't calculating at all. Because her rhetoric is centered on presuppositions, and because her discourse is the winning discourse, she apparently doesn't see a need to ground her claim about the climate commitments not being sufficient. If you look, holistic, if you look at things holistically, which is the intentionally vague modification she makes, intentionally because it saves her from giving grounds. That's how easy, much too easy, it is to give speeches as opposed to engage in debates. Pretending to be a climate leader while looking, locking in a future common agricultural policy that will make the Paris Agreement impossible to reach. Pretending that you will build back better after the pandemic, even though astronomical sums of money have already been locked in, and not in green projects, whatever green means. This clip shows how synecdoches are used for two things, to give the audience the impression that things are out of control, an irresponsibility discourse, and presuppose that certain actions are mutually exclusive. For example, that you can't be a climate leader and have policies that will supposedly make the Paris Agreement impossible to reach. It sounds an awful lot like Greta wants to be the only true leader. I don't know why that is though, because savior rhetoric is only for the people in power, right? Come to think of it, considering that she's so different from the people she criticizes, it's strange that she was invited to the summit in the first place. I'm sure if she had the opposite views, she'd still be invited, because every inclusive politician at this summit is interested in truly looking at things holistically. Wait. And when your empty words are not enough, when the protests grow too loud, you respond by making the protests illegal. That doesn't sound like a very holistic description of events. What a surprise. A protest made illegal because of the pressure from the collective we that she keeps presupposing the existence of, or because protesters are blocking roads, for example. But it's always more effective to play on people's indignation and appeal to their pity by making yourself sound like a victim. And that's exactly what the world needs. More victim narratives. We don't have enough of those. Of course, we welcome all efforts to safeguard future and present living conditions, and these distant net zero emissions targets could be a great start. Yes, because this speech has been nothing but welcoming. Something tells me that the positive atmosphere won't last, though. If they weren't full of gaps and loopholes. We can't have too much positivity after all. That would ruin the narrative and book sale. You've, um, this, this book here, as Phil said, you win the award for the heaviest book. The verb safeguard. safeguard is another presupposition, making her view sound positive for all people. Even though she hasn't presented solutions, grounded her claims, or told the audience what her far-reaching plans would mean for their present living conditions. Ignoring the crucial aspect of equity. Speeches allow speakers to use popular terms or terms they hope to popularize without having to specify them. Here, Greta mentions the buzzword equity in passing, just like she mentions the related term inequality in other speeches. Looking at Greta's speeches holistically, it's made clear that buying into her message means buying into an entire mindset, a package deal, of alleged causal relations between historical events that might not be causally related at all. And the climate crisis is, of course, only a symptom of a much larger crisis a sustainability crisis, a social crisis, a crisis of inequality that dates back to colonialism and beyond. A crisis based on the idea that some people are worth more than others and therefore have the right to exploit and steal other people's land and resources. And it is very naive to believe that we can solve this crisis without confronting the roots of it. Of course, and it is very naive. Of course, and naive, she says, assertively, appealing to a let shared knowledge that the connection between the crisis and the past is this simple and one-dimensional. The purpose of the shared knowledge technique is to avoid objections, as if there's no other way of looking at it than the way the speaker's looking at it. So However, what does the metaphor the confronting the roots mean? What will that mean for people's way of life? Speeches allow for much more intentional vagueness and ambiguity than debates. Next, it's time for more of the us and them discourse, the association tactic, because of course Greta can let people get the impression that her complaints aren't shared by everybody else. 
But as your acts continue, more and more of us are seeing through your manuscripts and your role playing. The gap between your actions and words is becoming more impossible to ignore, while more and more extreme weather events are raging all around us. And as a result, young people all over this planet are no longer falling for your lies. You are distancing yourself further and further away from us and from reality. The implication being that if people believe Greta, they believe in reality, which then means that if people don't believe her, they believe in a fantasy. As well as making these targets completely relying on fantasy scale, currently barely existing negative emissions technologies. Greta's way of presupposing an audience and claiming to know what it feels and thinks is called constitutive rhetoric, because she's literally constituting an audience rhetorically, as she's reading from her own manuscript. An audience which might not exist outside of her rhetoric. The ultimate goal of constitutive rhetoric is to get people to act according to the speaker's beliefs or commands more like it. This wish to constantly make it sound like she's speaking on behalf of a community and thus make people believe that there is a large community lead Greta to depersonalize personal questions. And so when you think back to that 15-year-old girl that stood outside Parliament on her own making a stand and then think actually how far even personally you've come in the last four years. How does that feel personally? Um, of course it's it's very difficult to describe uh, we never thought that it would be possible to do anything like that in the beginning it was just me and then it was a few a handful of others and even looked slightly annoyed you are a voice for so many that's a lot of pressure to have on young shoulders and i know you are definitely strong enough to handle it all but there must be moments when you you say we need to move slowly to peak to bring the public along However, how do you honestly expect to bring the people along if you don't treat this crisis like a crisis? Perhaps it's moving slowly because these are fundamental changes to people's lives. Also, I don't think that many people would say that the prices on many things today move slowly. Treat this crisis like a crisis. Greta points to the crisis discourse she's using. This could lead to speculations as to whether she's exaggerating or over-dramatizing certain points to keep the discourse alive and get people to unite around her. The climate crisis is today, at best, being treated only as a business opportunity to create new green jobs, new green businesses and technologies. This play on the word green is another classic from her script. Green jobs. Green jobs as a business opportunity. And what about the business opportunities that Greta and green politicians and leaders see in this? What are their financial interests? People are already seeing their interests. So could Greta actually have more in common with the people she condemns or pretends to condemn than she makes it seem? The leaders like to say, we can do this. If we do this together, we can do this. As the pandemic unfolded, you did not say this will benefit the face mark manufacturing industry or this will create new jobs in healthcare and hospitals. Translation, why won't you regurgitate my narrative everywhere all the time? Everywhere, all the time. Also, this is a moot point because you could make the objection. What about all the jobs that her ideas would render obsolete? She's already mentioned coal mines and oil fields. Perhaps playing a role helps you sleep at night. Saying things just for the sake of it, because the words are in your scripts. Yes, because Greta wouldn't dream of saying words from a script to underline the crisis discourse, to gain a following, to sell a book. But while you are busy working the stage, you seem to forget that the climate crisis is not something distant in the future. It is already taking so much from the most affected people in the most affected areas. Which indirectly has to do with another presupposition that's part of the package deal. But the climate crisis was created by us, the nations of the global north. This might just be a game to you, the ones who focus on the packaging rather than on the actual content. Yes, because this speech has contained so much actual content. It's not like she's been more focused on maintaining an angry tone of voice than giving specifics. And next, after a brief look in the script, it's time to sound angry again. I wonder if it's in the script. You can, and will, of course, choose to continue to play your parts, say your lines and wear your costumes. You can, and will, continue to pretend. She needs to presuppose that this is how they behave, 
Otherwise, it'd be the end of her narrative that she has financial interests in keeping alive. She also has a part to play, lines to say, and a costume to wear. Thus, enough is never enough. Victim narratives have no end goal. So, could she be the one pretending, or also pretending? The word is obviously on her mind. I'll let Greta finish this video. The audience has grown wary. The show is over.